Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Again, welcome to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. This is the time we go around the room and introduce ourselves. Uh, please don't try, try not to make it a rapid fire. Uh, please say, my name is. My name is Jay Corbett. My name is Bill McCartney. My name is Dennis Mayhew. My name is Darren Taylor. My name is Clark Freshman. My name is George Hubbard. My name is David Munkako. My name is Peter. My name is Kate Sida. My name is Tom Thurston. My name is Rich Baranel. My name is Anthony Rainsford. My name is Andre. My name is, <coughs> My name is Tony Pasqua. My name is Bob Hamilton. I'm Leor. My name is Peter. My name is David. My name is Jim Stewart. <coughs> My name is Willie really Dyer. My name is Tage Lovia. My name is Harvey Putin. I'm Larry Wish. <coughs> My name is Roy King. My name is Gabriel Clark. <coughs> My name is Will Murdoch. Peter. My name is Doug Bonkos. My name is Richard Adelini. Morning. My name is Scott Davis. My name is Jerry Jones. My name is Tom Bruin. My name is Paul Bull. My name is Paul Shepard. My name is Tom Morrissey. My name is Ed Morello. I'm Jack Weissman. My name is Barry Eisenberg. My name is Tom. And my name is Tom. My name is Lee Robbins. My name is Joe Weston. Uh, my name is Harley Shapiro. My name is Peter. My name is Michael Murphy. My name is Ed Babin. I'm David Hollander. <coughs> Rule Walker. I'm David Ross. Anyone else? Anyone here for the first or second time? The Newland. Okay. Please welcome our <coughs> relative newcomers. Don't treat them with contempt. You show old time members. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased to welcome our speaker today, uh, Joe Weston. Joe is an experienced uh, workshop facilitator, body worker, and life coach. He was born and educated in New York, and then lived for 17 years in, I guess, would be old Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. um, he brings uh, a wealth of insights into his work from a variety of traditions, including Tibetan Buddhism, and he's the initiator of the Heartwalker Peace Project and runs Heartwalker Studios in Oakland, where a variety of uh, activities in the gay community occur. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. How you doing, guys? So I just I just got back from New York, so if my Queen's accent comes out, just uh, how you doing? <laughs> Anyone else from Queens? There's usually someone, yeah, I'm from Queens. <laughs> Um, so it's great to see you. I just want to start by saying um, how I'm rejoicing in seeing um, this group coming together on a Sunday morning, uh, that knowing how busy our lives are and how crazy our lives are, that we can find the time to, uh, for ourselves and for others and for community to come together. Uh, I just want to acknowledge how in the scheme of the world as it is today, how miraculous that is. And uh, so I rejoice in each one of you for making the time to do that. Thank you. And uh, keep it up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a lot of things to talk about. 
about the different things I'm doing, I was specifically asked to speak maybe more about this work that I've developed called Respectful Confrontation, which is a new way of approaching this. For me, it's about compassionate engagement. And I'd like to, and I teach workshops in that and, and do lectures in that and uh, developing and expanding that more. And I'm finding how much more I love it and how much more I really believe that it is uh, truly connected with my Buddhist practice. And it's nice to sit here and so to come out and just say, I am a Tibetan Buddhist, I am a Tibetan Buddhist, and to not have to feel like I have to hide that or worry about someone else's uh, issues around that. So it's sweet to be here and to be with my gay brothers here to discuss this. And I'm enjoying, if we, when we get to talk about it, to really speak of it from a Buddhist perspective, and I'd love to hear your opinions on that. Um, but to just give you a little idea of, of me, I'm, I grew up in Flushing, Queens, I had Jewish parents, and uh, I think I... Are there any other jew boos here? <laughs> Oi, is all I can say. Oi. Um, I grew up, I think, like a lot of American Jewish children, where you know we were, we were supposed to adhere to, all, to, to a lot of the customs. We ate chicken soup, but we really didn't know the traditions. We really didn't practice the Torah or anything like that. And for me, it was a lot of hypocrisy. And... And I really, even as a child, questioned, what is, what is this God thing? What is this creator God thing? And I really, even as a child, thought, I don't really buy that, that there's one fella who created everything, that there's a creator God. Yet I did feel, on a deeper level, that there was something larger that was permeating all of it. And as a child, I just sat with that. And because of that, I was kicked out of Hebrew school, they just said, we can't deal with him. He asks too many questions that we can't answer, so please take him away. Um, yet I was bar mitzvah, and uh, my mother persisted. And um, uh, This might come into the story, but I was bar mitzvah late because my father was in prison and, and around the time when I was 13, so we didn't have the money or the time to bar mitzvah me. So, and I was like, great, because I didn't want to be bar mitzvah, but that did an event when he got out of prison. <clears throat> I was bar mitzvah, so that was done. And then sometime around 14, I was searching for things and ended up at 14 years old in an introduction evening for a Church of Scientology and ran out after about two hours. And I, and I, and I was searching since, and I really dabbled in a lot of things. And that was most of my young adult life was dabbling. And at a certain point, I felt deep within myself that I can dabble the rest of my life. I can be a spiritual consumer. Where I know where a lot of people do that, and for a lot of people, that is fine. If you're doing that, great. At least you're consuming spiritualism, <laughs> spirituality. Um, but I really felt like I needed to go deeper. I needed to find a practice that would really anchor it and make it part of my life. And somehow Buddhism really emerged as that. And I started exploring Zen, and I loved it. And for me, how many of you are Zen practitioners here? Oh, wow. okay. Well, I love Zen. And for me, it was like, oh, there was something very austere and very stark about it that really appealed to me. And I thought, maybe... And then oh, and at the same time, I went to a Tibetan Buddhist uh, session where it's a lot of noise, a lot of color, and, and it's a mess. And I was like, oh, yeah, boy, is this a mess. <laughs> and I thought, well... You know what? The austere it, it appeals. It's too easy for me. Maybe I should go for the mess and see if I can find my my silence in that and stillness in that. So in 1993, I read um, in, in September of 1993. It's now 15 years ago. I read Lama Yeshe. Anyone know Lama Yeshe? Brilliant, brilliant teacher, uh, and he was a really instrumental, uh, very instrumental in bringing Tibetan Buddhism to the West. He wrote a book called Tantra: An Introduction. I truly believe it is the greatest Dharma book ever written. It's a very simple book. It doesn't go deeply into the practices of Tantra, but the introduction of it, it is so insightful. It's, for me, reading it was like a direct transmission. So I read that 15 years ago, and a year later I walked in, when I was living in old Amsterdam in Holland, I went to a Tibetan Buddhist center, which is part of the, the FPMT centers, Federation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition. And there I met my teacher, Geshe Sonam Gyatsen. 
Es así. And uh, he was just new to the West and didn't get a lot of Western cultures, and he's now adapted a bit. But he's still in Holland, and he's been my teacher since. And uh, coincidentally, the first uh, class I walked into was on the Lojong, which is the practices of developing the compassionate heart. It's the practices of uh, compassion. And that has been my hook. I've noticed that in all the teachings I've done, and all the studying I've done, I've always come back to the practices and the teachings and the, and the lineage of Avalokiteshvara, Chen Rezig, Kanon, Kuan Yin. Did I leave anyone else out? Any, anyone out? The practices of, of deep compassion. Um, so does that give you an idea of, my, of, of how I come to Buddhism? And, you know, my background is in theater. Uh, from theater I started teaching, and I love that, and I just noticed that uh, in the teaching, that uh, as I was teaching acting, that not only were people learning how to act, but their lives were transforming, that they were discovering more of who they were. Because uh, for me, a lot of my work was about if you want to be able to port portray someone else, you have to know who you are. So a lot of the acting training I was offering was in self-discovery, self-awareness. And I started getting more turned on by that than the other stuff. And then I started thinking maybe I should pursue that more. And I then started learning about body work. I then got involved with Body Electric. How many of you know Body Electric? It's an amazing school, amazing school in terms of understanding how uh, but erotic healing and using uh, erotic healing as a, as a path towards enlightenment. Very beautiful work and, and, and understanding the depths of <coughs> intimacy. And, and that really opened up a lot. I became a, fac uh, a facilitator on, uh, on staff for Body Electric and started incorporating that into my work. And um, that led into corporate training and into com working with communication, which eventually got me back to this sense of communication and peace. And what I'm discovering is that that's where I'm headed, and that's you know, and I dared to call myself. I'm going to be teaching this work, the respectful confrontation work, at the Tse Chen Ling, which is a Buddhist center here in San Francisco, in October. And when I was giving a bio of what I was, I dared for the first time to call myself a peace advocate. I like the way that sounds, a peace advocate. So this, for me, this, this is a, a, as I'm sitting here, this, these last few months have been a process of coming out and, and fully embracing and, and and, uh, anchoring who I am. So, um, peace advocate. So that's so that's the work I'm doing, and, and I've developed a program, in a sense, called practicing lasting peace, which it's, it would be interesting to share with you. Has three parts to it, um, and the first part is the practice of courageous self reflection. <laughs> The second part is the practice of compassionate engagement. And the last part is the practice of creative generosity. And I was sitting with uh, one of the teachers at Tse Chen Ling, Venerable Robina Cortin, and I was telling her about this. And she said, does anybody know Robina? <laughs> Oi, is all I have to say. <laughs> if you don't know Robina, get to know Robina. And she just said in her own way, well, basically, that's she just all you've done is you've taken the Buddhist teachings and give it a new name. I was like, oh, okay, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> and for me, what that is, is the courageous self-reflection is, the, is in, in the Buddhist traditions, the, the, the wisdom wing, uh, exploring wisdom, exploring the self, and understanding the depths of that. The um, compassionate engagement is the compassion wing, is exploring how are you with others, and, 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 and the uh, creative uh, generosity is more loving-kindness. So that's the, you have uh, Manjushri, the, the wisdom wing, Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezig, the uh, compassion wing, and Maitreya, uh, the loving-kindness wing. And so the whole path of that is, I believe, that it's almost uh, it's a calling for us as human beings in our evolution right now on this planet to be practicing these things in whatever form. You don't have to practice the way I say you practice it, but that we're practicing that. That it's not enough anymore to just practice wisdom. I guess this is really my... I'm a, I'm a natural Mahayanist. Do you all know the term Mahayana? Does anyone not know the term Mahayana? I'd be glad to explain. Um, 
in the Buddhist path, in the Buddhist path, you, there's a, uh, well, certainly from the Tibetan point of view, there's the Lam Rim, which has the, the graduated path towards enlightenment. And the first path, the lowest scope, is about the self, about this lifetime. It's about understanding that, that the, the, the basic Four Noble Truths, that life is suffering, that there are causes to suffering, that there are ways to overcome and eliminate those causes to suffering, which will eliminate your suffering. And Buddhism is one way towards that. And so the, 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 the lowest scope is basically, well, I want to just make sure I'm doing well in this lifetime. The middle scope is the Hinayana scope, which basically says that it's not just enough that I'm taking care of this lifetime, because on next lifetime I'm going to come back and I'm going to have to start the whole process all over again. So in a sense, what am I, can I do in this lifetime to be liberated from the cycle of suffering, samsara? So the Hinayana path is personal liberation from suffering. That's already a, quite a job. <laughs> The first one's quite a job. That's, that's certainly a job. And the Mahayana path, which is the, what they call the, the greatest scope, is, well, what's so cool about me hanging out in nirvana by myself when all these other dudes are suffering? So actually, it's not enough for me to, to just go for my own personal liberation. I want to make sure that everyone else is liberated. Then we'll have a party. So that's the Mahayana scope. And, and the true Mahayana path is saying, I'm not going to be enlightenment. I'll stay in suffering as long as I need to to make sure that everyone isn't in suffering. Does everyone's shoulders just go like that a little bit? Like, oh. <laughs> it's a big burden to carry if you, if you see it that way. So, um, so in a sense, what, what I'm saying with this last, lasting practice in peace is that it's more, it's in a sense, a Mahayana uh, motivation of... I can work on myself, but what do I do with that? And, and so uh, working on myself is already a way of transforming the world. Does anyone agree with that or not agree with that? You know, if, I'm, if I'm working on myself, then my, I have to have an influence on my immediate surroundings and, 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 and so forth, and my viewpoints <coughs> and affect the viewpoints of others. But what many of us are finding is that we're developing ourselves, yet we are not... Um, skilled in how we relate to others on a, on a real level, on a real compassionate level. As long as it's all nice and pretty, we're okay, but as soon as it starts getting a little messy, what do we do? So the respectful confrontation is really about that. I say that the respectful confrontation um, is empowering the nice guy. And, I, and in a sense saying, how many of you consider yourself nice guys? Please be honest. Come on, come out, guys. Come out. I know that there's a lot of shame around it, but raise your hand high. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> so there's a real, there's a whole thing there about us being nice guys. There's a whole stigma around it. And, and unfortunately, in our society, and certainly in American society, it's not that celebrated. I'm generalizing, and I'm, and I'm just saying I'm speaking for the larger scope. I mean, we have a phrase, uh, nice guys finish last. And our whole sense of power in this country and, and in the world, but specifically in this country, is really about basically what's your level of brute force. The larger your level of brute force the more powerful you are. The more you can win at the expense of others, perhaps, the more powerful you are. I'm feeling everyone getting a little uncomfortable as I'm talking about it. Are you noticing? Is anyone feeling uncomfortable with me talking about this? You are. Okay. You want to say something about that? No, it's just a feeling that... Okay. Of almost of hopelessness. Okay. When I see how much of that exists. Thank you. Can we all take a breath for that? What's your name? Tom. Tom, thank you. It's a feeling. Does anyone else share that feeling? Thank you. It's something to tap into. I mean, I'm not here to 
paint a bleak picture of the world. I'm just here to ex explore. Yes? I actually felt relief listening to you. In what way? I don't know, just I was relieved to hear somebody say those things. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's what a lot of the, the, the work is with respectful confrontation. It's basically, my, my sense is, and what my observation is, is that um, so many things have been mixed up and, 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 and put together. And because of that, we don't have any clarity on the situation, and we opt out usually for not being in our power, in a sense. Because most of our role models, it says, if we be in our power, that means we have to be violent, we have to use brute force, we have to hurt. Something has to be destroyed. Most of our views are that. So what happens to sensitive people who don't want to do that? We either play into the game and, and, and basically sacrifice our values, <coughs> or we do everything we can to hold back being in our power. So the work is, it's about, and honey, I'm glad you say it like that, is saying there is hope. It is possible to be in your heart. It is possible to be a sensitive human being and value that and be in your power. And that what that asks for is a redefinition and a reframing of what power is, of what conflict is, of what assertiveness is. And that's what the work is about. So much of it is mixed up, all of those things. Like the image I use is you have a big barrel of salt and sugar, and it's all mixed. And what if I were to say to you now, would you please pull out all the salt grains and separate them from the sugar grains to put them into two piles? Who would like to take on that job? <laughs> it's hard. And that's how much we have... Uh, mixed up so many concepts around power and about assertiveness and all of those things, about conflict and confrontation. And because they're all mixed up, we, and we don't want to opt into the violence or the bullying, we just choose to throw out the whole barrel and say, you know what, I'm just not going to be in my power. I'll just stay nice. I won't speak my truth. And we'll see what happens. And what I'm positing with this work and, and in, in my true relationship with Avalokiteshvara is that that's not compassion. That's not a compassionate way to be. It's a nice way to be. But being nice is not necessarily being compassionate. And have any of you seen the images of Avalokiteshvara? The different, he's, he's presented with two arms and two legs. He's presented with three heads and four arms. Have you ever seen those? He's presented with a thousand arms and eleven heads. Ah, he manifested right there for me. <laughs> um, and that all came from his desire. Do you know the story of Avalokiteshvara? Um, basically, he was a bodhisattva. May we say he's either a bodhisattva. What I love about Avalokiteshvara, first of all, is that he's very two-spirited. Did you know that? He's, he's very two-spirited. He's always, he's always depicted throughout the Buddhist tradition as being um, androgynous. You see those groovy, groovy uh, bell-bottoms he's wearing? Very <laughs> colorful, rainbow, groovy bell-bottoms. He's, he's pretty groovy. And uh, neither male nor female. And he was hanging out, and he was just because he's the he's you know the the, the 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 compassion guy, and he was just feeling. One day, he just saw the suffering, and he started crying, and crying, and crying, and couldn't stop. And and just said, I can't take this all this suffering. And from his tears, he grew more two more arms, and two more heads, as a way of from his desire to be of service to others, he gained more power and more skill and ability to be of service to others. You can do a lot more with forearms than you can with two. And then he was hanging out, helping people out, and then all of a sudden he realized that there's still more suffering. It's not going away. And he sat down and started crying again, and, and cried for a long time. And from his tears, he got a thousand arms and eleven heads. And he could do a lot more with that. And then he's helping more people, and then he sat down, realized his suffering and sat down and started crying. And, and 
from his tears and his desire to be of service, of service, he manifested into more wrathful deity forms. And that for me is an important element in this work, is that compassion is not always just flowering. Com- compassion means sometimes you have to say no. I'll give an example. And it really always comes down to the beauty of this, is that according to, 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 to specifically Tibetan Buddhist traditions, that um, uh, a, in terms of the laws of karma, uh, something that manifests or something that is an action that is done is dependent purely on the motivation for that thing. What determines the impact or the, or the, of a phenomenon, of a result, is purely dependent on the motivation of the cause from it. So a lot of people think, well, Joe, what are you saying? Are you saying that sometimes I may need to hit someone? Or does it mean that I have to be really mean or wrathful? And sometimes I'll say, yeah, you may need to be, to truly be compassionate. If your motivation is in the right place. I'll give an example. I heard a story about a man who was in the jungle with his daughter. And sometime moment in the jungle he slit open his daughter's throat. Now, what's the first thing you think of when you hear that? Anybody? Psycho killer. <laughs> what's up, psycho killer? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? How Cer- awful. Hmm? How awful. How awful? Certainly a harmful deed, with some, you'd think with some pretty serious karmic results on the, on the way. Well, the story is, is that they were in the jungle and she got bitten by a snake. And the venom of this snake, uh, the, the way it manifests in the body, is that it closes the throat and people suffocate and die. So this man had a decision to make. Does he watch his daughter die? Or does he slit open her throat so that he can provide her with oxygen? Which is what he did. So, if you the point I'm telling that is that, and you see, the deed itself is not good or bad. It's dependent on its motivation. His motivation was to save his daughter's life. Does that make sense? So, it's it's just looking at ways of compassion coming in. That sometimes, if your motivation is good, sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes you have to be more wrathful. And do we have the courage to do that, to speak our truth? Yeah? You know, I have a bit of a reaction to that, mm-hmm. which is that um, if you're talking about a person's individual karma, that is true, that there's a certain truth to that. So that even if he had been mistaken about his daughter and what was the best thing to do, if he had been completely unskillful, his own karma might have been fine. But if he had not been skillful, if he had not been, uh, if he had not known correctly what was going on with her, she might have died and suffered tremendously. Right. And her karma, the cause and effect as to her, would have been quite horrific. So I just feel like it's important to bear that in mind that uh, I've never found that teaching of Tibetan Buddhism particularly persuasive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that um, at all, yeah. I think it's a little bit. It's it's. Incomplete understanding, not not, not wrong view, but just incomplete view that the consequences of our actions, as to the world, do not depend solely upon our motivation, but upon our, upon our skill, mm-hmm. and so part of the, and maybe this is part of your view, is that part of whether we're wrathful or not, the reason why he could manifest as, ra- as a wrathful deity and that was okay was that he was, he had greater skill as well. He was able, he wasn't merely that his motivation in manifesting as a wrathful deity was to enlighten people, but it was that he had the skill to know when that was appropriate. And so I just wonder about that. I agree. You know, with ourselves. I agree. I think that's great. Thank you for clarifying that. I agree with that. I think it's, I mean, the Buddha himself said, you know, I'm all-knowing, 
yet I still don't get karma. The karma is so complicated. It's such a complicated teaching. that. Uh, so what you're saying is, Joe, you're, it sounds like you're oversimplifying a little bit. In some ways I am, just to, to make clarify one point. So I want to just add the context of that, that yes, I think we have to be mindful of all of our actions. And that... Um, <clears throat> You're using the word skillful, I would use the word wisdom. You know, the beings like, like these beings have the, <coughs> the insight to see into the future and, or, or to know the ramifications of their actions. And until we have that, we have to be very mindful of our actions. I guess I just wanted to point the picture. I'm just trying to point out. So that's a whole other discussion, and I agree that it's not only motivation, but that it's an important part of it, that it also depends on. There are many factors to karma, which I, if I'd love to hang out with you all day and talk about. <laughs> does that? Does that? Yeah. So thank you for contributing that. Uh, another example of that would be if I was walking down the down the street with a friend and I wanted to impress him and took a twenty dollar bill out and gave it to um, a homeless person. My intention would be to impress my friend, right. and there isn't a whole lot of karma that goes. Well, there is karma. It's still you're still you're still creating karma. You're still creating positive karma. That person is still benefiting from the twenty dollars. It's just what's the, de, the what's the degree or degree of the karma that you're creating based on your motivation. Thank you for that as well. Um, so the, the work is really looking at how can we be in our power. How can we still stay? And and I think you know interestingly enough, if we look at uh, American politics and we look at I really am keeping an eye out on, on the Obama campaign and how they're. It's a perfect example. The last, you know, the, the last two elections, 2000 and 2004, you see a very a similar, a very typical pattern, of where the Democrats they come with their values and and people really f say that's great. This makes sense. It makes sense. Very humanistic. Let's take care of each other. Values, and then at a certain point around convention time, the Republicans come in and they start bullying. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking sides, I'm just viewing it. That, that's been the tactics. So please, I'm trying to stay open and bipartisan. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but go ahead anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm just observing that this is, what, this is, this is, how, this is how it's operating. That, that the bully tactic comes in, and the, and, and the Democrats say, we don't want to play into the bully tactics. We don't want to be bullies. We don't want to fight the same way. Do you get that? Do you recognize that? So what happens is, well, then we'll just stick with our values and we'll just stay nice. And the Democrats have lost the last two elections because of that. And I'm really watching Obama and seeing the Obama campaign and seeing that they're trying to do it differently. That what happened just a few weeks ago when they're in the Republican convention was big time bullying. And it's working. And so the, and that's so the, that's the dilemma for all of us. This has been my dilemma throughout my life. You know, growing up in New York City, I, I had to fight, and I hated it. And I didn't. At a certain point, I stopped fighting because I didn't. I thought it was really stupid. Why bother fighting? If I'm going to fight with someone, I might as well fight. If it means I hate them, that means I'll fight to the death. So if I'm not, if I don't hate them enough to kill them, I'm not going to fight with them. And I was seen as a sissy. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's you know, for sensitive boys, this is this has been our plight, and I, I've gone through a whole life process of really going of really healing that. You know, one thing, one gift I had was that my father, because he was embarrassed, taught me how to fight. I hated every moment of it because he was a fighter, literally a boxer. He was a fighter, and got into many fights. I hated every moment of it, but now I can turn it around and say I'm really blessed that this man loved me. That was his way of expressing his love, was to show me how to fight. <clears throat> then I started uh, practicing Tai Chi and understands, under, understood different levels of what power was and using my power, manifesting power, and then did more aggressive forms of like Taekwondo and things like that. And I noticed within myself, I could walk down the street and I felt more confident. I wasn't as reactive. Because I felt like I could protect myself. I could defend myself. So I became less violent and less reactive because I was studying how to fight. And again, if you look at world politics, is that a lot of 
violence happens is because we think we can't protect ourselves. Terrorists, communists, all that kind of thing. So all the money and energy that goes into fighting, for many, really when you look down to it on a deeper level, is because we feel like we can't protect ourselves. So um, in, in this process of respectful confrontation, I redefine power. That it's not just about strength. That power has four qualities. It has the quality of um, groundedness, of focus, of strength, and of flexibility. And that's... Uh, what I believe is that when we're skilled in those four things, we're truly in our power, which means we can stand openly from, from our hearts. <clears throat> so think about it in your life. You know, in, in, in how, how much have you manifested any of those, or what, which have you mostly manifested? I think gay men, particularly on a certain level, are very skilled in flexibility. And that's an enormous power. Is that There's a Taoist... Uh, saying, which says, which is stronger, the mighty oak or a blade of grass? And the result, the second part of that is, in a monsoon, the mighty oak will snap like a twig, and the grass will always yield and, and persevere and prevail. So which is stronger? So in some situations, the mighty oak is stronger, in some situations, the blade of grass is stronger. And part of this process of redefining and reframing power is that we don't only have to use brute force. Sometimes bring, just focus is enough. Sometimes just grounding is enough. Sometimes courage is enough. Strength and courage is necessary to speak your truth. And guys, even more importantly, having the courage to hear someone else's truth. Ooh. And sometimes flexibility is necessary. And a good martial artist is trained in all four. Can't just be strong. You have to be connected to the earth and grounded. You have to have an awareness and sensitivity around you. I find that a lot of gay men are have an enormous sensitivity. And until we know how to focus that, it can get it gets in our way. We pick up other people's negativities. We're we're very we. We're easily swayed to other people's viewpoints because we hear their points and we're like, yeah, that sounds great. So we as gay men actually have a number of powerful skills in this reframing, in our grounding, in our focus, in our courage, and in our flexibility. And that's the beginning point of this work. And, and then the question is, what happens when we are standing in our truth? What is conflict? What is confrontation? And again, because we mix them up, we don't confront. To me, uh, the way I define that is that all conflict can be avoided and resolved with healthy confrontation. All conflict. Say that again. All conflict can be avoided and resolved with healthy confrontation. And they are two different things. Confrontation, conflict is the breakdown of relationships, separation, win-lose, right-wrong. That separates. See it manifesting in the world. See it manifesting through human existence. Confrontation is with front open. Open heart. Courage to speak your truth. Courage to hear someone else's truth. To stand in your vulnerability across from someone. Because I believe that it is only in your vulnerability that you will find your true power. Only. So, are you using the word confrontation, which frequently has an aggressive connotation, but actually you mean assertiveness, appropriate assertiveness, as opposed to aggression? <clears throat> Thank you for saying that, because that's the whole point of this, is that I'm using the word confrontation to um, get back to what it originally means. Mm -hmm. and that's my point about the sugar and the salt. 
is that we immediately associate confrontation with conflict, aggression, where it's not. Webster, and I'm not talking about the little actor, I'm talking about the dictionary, says it as well. I like to go to Webster to get my to get to, to back me up. My guys like I got my buds here who back me up. Um, it, in the Webster's Dictionary, when it talks about conflict, it says a competitive or opposing action of incompatibles, Anta antagonistic state of action, fight, battle, war. And um, confront says to face, to cause to meet, bring face to face. <clears throat> So the, the point is, let's, I think the point of the work is to take out the misunderstanding in the word confrontation and see it as, I think, uh, our path to resolving conflict. Do you, do you have a... Well, uh, an incident happened to me that may illustrate well, what you're talking about. I had a friend who tended to always be very snide and sarcastic and so forth. And we were walking along Gough Street once and he said something curt to me. And for some reason or other, I said, instead of sniping back, I said, that hurt. He immediately shifted and started backtracking and so forth. And I vividly remember this sense of power mm. shifting. And, you know, I think I stood up taller for a second, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and was, I, I remember exactly where I was when that thing happened. I and mean, I think that illustrates what you're talking about. It's perfect. Thank you. It's a perfect example. It's as simple as that. That's using focus, groundedness, courage, strength, and the flexibility. Because what if he came back to you and said, ah, yeah, uh, you're just and a big sissy. Huh? Vulnerability, too. Yeah, the vulnerability. Yeah. The, the vulnerability to speak your truth. What if he said, ah, you're just a big sissy or something like that? Then, it, then, then, the, then it comes, well, wait a minute. You're not hearing me. You're not hearing my truth. You're not hearing my feelings here. So... Great that the, your and your friend was able to adapt. Yeah, great, great. Well, that wasn't what he intended. It was a style exactly. of communicating that we had, and uh, I guess I put the mirror up and you know, this is what you're doing. Thank you. That's that's a perfect example. That's what it's about. And by doing that, not only are, are you empowering yourself, but you're empowering him because you're helping him. It's like giving him feedback. I just want to let you know that your actions have consequences. So it causes him, in a loving way, it causes him to think about that. Plus, it will deepen your relationship. And that's the point. Confrontation brings us closer. If you find that what you're doing or saying is bringing you further away, that's conflict. If you're finding that what you're doing or saying is bringing you closer, that's confrontation. Do you want to... Uh... Yeah, from the opposite end. When somebody is truthful and says, hey, would you like to go out? And then, yeah, we'll go out. And then they don't call you because they're afraid to tell you that they don't really don't want to go out with you. That's, right. that's the inability to confront face-to-face -face from the opposite end yeah. of it, where there was no aggression, no, just a truthfulness. Yes. Thank you. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot, a lot. Of, that. A lot of that in the gay community. There's a lot of that in the gay community. of Because we're frightened to confront... We choose a reactive behavior, which is flight. Basically, just uh, I just won't deal with it, and we don't realize that you know that the consequences of that—that that not doing something has enormous consequences. Thanks. I, I've uh, achieved uh, well, not that I want to. There's no way to achieve it, but there has been a peaceful situation as a result of. Uh, recognizing that my older brother really isn't there the way I think, that I'm not there the way he thinks, that we're not thoughts, that there's just this enormous emptiness that we've tangled into a confusion, or that has been tangled into a confusion. Mm -hmm. and my recognition of the enormous emptiness of all of that, that it doesn't really, uh, there's, there's really nobody there and nothing there, and no ego and no whatever, has made it very peaceful for me. I could, I could use the word successful to label that, but I could not use the word confrontation because if anything, I'll never talk to him again. Right. 
Well, in that situation, no. I mean, that uh, part of the part of the respectful <coughs> confrontation work is not only confronting others; it's also being willing to confront yourself. I know people who've said that the most powerful part of this work, and that is what a lot of martial arts is about. It's it's not so much that you learn how to fight with others; it's learning skills to be able to navigate your own demons or your own patterns or your own or however, however your mind manifests. So there's a way of doing that without actually confronting that person, but to, but to confront your own fears about it, to confront your own, to speak your own truth to yourself around it. So there's a lot to talk about. I mean, I'm noticing that it's, I feel it's churning up some things in some of you. I feel that there's, there's, uh, there's an energy around it, which I think is great. It means you're invested on a certain level in it, and, it, and, it, and it's touching something. It's to, and... and uh, yeah? I'm uh, sitting here with a lot of ambivalent uh, feelings and it's going to be fun to express them. Uh, <laughs> that uh, I find who you are, because I've met you before, and what you're saying is that to be very attractive and the strength uh, and confidence and whatever. And then I'm also alternatively offended by, um, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm probably not using perfect words, but the kind of branding of this thing. I have, have a little bit of the same response that the Buddhist teacher had of, that's Buddhism, or another response of that's not violent communication language, kind of how dare you mix it all together and say that you have a Joe Weston product. Mm. That, that's how it comes across a little bit to me, and um, partially I imagine, I, I feel like I'm a pretty confident person and hold my own in the world and, and such, and I wouldn't be able to sit where you are doing what you're doing because it would feel um, uh, not humble enough for me. I think it's important to share these these truths, but um, anyway. Uh, What's your point? What do you? I'm, I'm just saying, listening to you uh, puts me in a conflicted point because I want everybody in the room to be able to sit there and, and be as confident and right. say the things that you say and I'm well aware that that, we're, that everybody is not mm. you know so it's kind of like dancing you know if you're dancing with somebody you want some frame you want some way to, to do it and I hope that I uh, I've said to you even directly that you know I'd like to get to know you better and be your friend or whatever so I'm not trying to be mm -hmm. horrible but it does bring up um you know, just out of... Uh, so, so, if I may, Larry, what yeah. I'm hearing is, is um, uh, what I'm hear how I take that is that I'm hearing an enthusiasm, that it's stirring up a lot, and that, it, and that there's something that's resonating with you that says this could be cool, and let's all be able to do this. Let's all, let's all be able to speak this. And I agree. So I want to just, uh, at least that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, that's part of what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I don't think it's mine. I, I, I don't claim anything is, I, I try not to. I mean, I... I my intention is to just um, help cut through the confusion. And my work is all about, when people do my workshops, is, is my intention is to um, empower them. And I make that very clear, that it, it doesn't serve me or you or anyone. If, it's, if it's, you're just listening to what I have to say, it's about, and this is to me about what practice is about and what, what meditation and Buddhism is about as well. Is, and the Buddha said that, said don't take whatever I'm saying as true. You know, you can't, don't. If you're doing that, you're not really being a good Buddhist. You have to take it and you have to examine it so from that all sides. That um, calms me greatly. Thank you. Thank you for keeping my ego in check. <laughs> <laughs> and that's respectful confrontation. Okay, with that, I think we should uh, move on to announcements. Thank you very much, Joe. Can I just say one more thing? <laughs> sure. sure. Can I say one? Um, so, <laughs> i got a lot more to say. So I, I um, we just touched on it, and I, I'm doing a, this workshop in uh, in a week a weekend uh, version of this in, in November, November seventh through the ninth in Oakland, and I have flyers here. And if anybody from this group wants to do the workshop, I'm offering a fifty dollar discount, and I really encourage you to come and continue this discussion uh, with this. And how I'd <laughs> like to close with this is that I, I truly believe that each one of you have an enormous amount of power, uh, true true personal power. And, uh, and I encourage you to shine with it. It, it. We're now living in a time where we need, where we need all of us here 
to be able to stand up and truly, without shame, without fear, allow our, our light to shine, our gifts to shine, our power to shine. We, we, the world needs us. So I really implore you to muster up the focus, the groundedness, the courage, and the flexibility to let that manifest. Because not just for you, the world needs you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will you be around afterwards to answer any other questions people might have? Sure. Yeah. Uh, are there any announcements? I'm the, I'm the host today, and um, there's some fruit and some breads out there. Please help yourself. Um, there's tea as well, and just make sure to clean your cup when you're done with some soapy water. That's it. Um, there's a Donna bowl and a suggested donation. There's $58 for you to care to give. And um, uh, some of us meet at the end at 12.30 and go out for lunch. So you can hang out by the door if you do that. That's it. That's sign up sheet for your Because there's a sign up sheet on the table over there if you want to get it on the, the roster. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jerry, your student coordinator. Thanks, Joe, for coming to speak to us. And next week, Dave Rico will be here to speak to us. Thank you. I wanted to invite Joe to talk about the heart walk for that next Sunday. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Next Sunday, um, uh, we're gathering at Justin Herman Plaza for a new kind of peace walk, the Heart Walker Peace Project. Where we'll be walking in the shape of a heart through San Francisco and a route that's in the shape of a heart as a celebration of peace. We're not anti anything. There's going to be music, some great bands. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're not going to your retreat, um, hope to see you at Justin Herman Plaza. I have postcards here. <coughs> Yeah. 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 Hey, we're, um, the Todd Pro who for a long time has been maintaining our mailing list and providing labels for the, the newsletter mailings um, has to step back. And so we're looking for someone with, you know, who is reasonably comfortable working with an Excel spreadsheet. And it's not a labor intensive job, it's just, um, you know, once every two months, two months uh, introducing the new names into the list and generating the labels um, for the mailings. So if, uh, if this sounds like an easy thing you could do, um, talk to me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Also related to the newsletter, I'm just looking for a one-time volunteer to help us with the mailing two weeks from today. So if anybody can do that, please. Do you have one? Any other announcements? Let's uh, stand in a circle for closing. Life is a cabaret. <laughs> uh, let's take a breath. I invite you to breathe one more time deeply into your heart. And take a moment and just think for yourself about the auspiciousness of us coming together. for connecting, devotion to our practice and to one another. And may this, the efforts of this gathering manifest in a way that supports us in our spiritual growth for our own well-being and the well-being of others. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please 
Subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.